they don't see the values in these old pictures and these old archives. But to me, I got a chance to ride on that way. That's why, that's one of the main reasons why I kept it. I didn't understand when I was riding on it then how important it was to be independent in 1925 and own your own business. Can you imagine being independent, building your wagon, putting wheels on it that hold a thousand pounds of ice, taking two little boys with you, and going through the city, dropping off 10 cent ice here, 20 cent ice here, 50%, 50 cent yes. ice here. But this business was a necessity for the entire community, black and white. Whites would, if you look at this picture, what was important to me is my grandfather wore a white shirt and khaki pants and a bow tie every day. Do you know who those two people were? I know one him? of the boys on there, the only thing I know, they used to call him Knucklehead. My dad used to like Knucklehead. He's a tough little dude and he liked to work. And uh, my uncle and I used to ride with him too sometimes. And um, these are the guys that he would get off the wagon and go to the back and chip the ice and they had ice hooks. You hook the ice and the boys would take it to the house, put it in the tub, and most people kept um, a, tarpo a tarpaulin over it to keep the ice from, um, from melting. So I always treasure this picture because in seeing my daddy open the business, now I knew that my grandfather opened a business. Okay? And so where did you find that picture at? This picture was kept by my daddy. My daddy had this picture. And my grandmother had a picture similar to this too. So your father was like, like some type of archivist for the family. He oh, kept yeah. things of importance. Well, he lived through that transition. But he came out of family that was independent in their business. So they owned their own land? Yes. Yeah. They owned their own horses. They owned their own equipment to for the horse. Their own, own wagon. They had to have maintenance and upkeep. And then he had his own uniform. Is that the track that I see behind in front of the white? Yeah, this is real this picture was taken on Railroad Avenue in Plaquemine. I could take you exactly where it is. They got a little stove right across the street called a, a hip and hop stove, which was about 10 blocks from where we lived at. And this was one of his routes. Now, they had other ice men in other segments of the city, city but he took care of the major part of the city and mostly white community. And that's why the whites used to call him the governor. The governor can go in houses that nobody else could go in because they had to have that ice. And them little boys couldn't take it. The governor had to take it in. Because they had some real rich white folks back then. The Wilbur's, the Cays, owned thousands of acres of land. You know, but they respected him because of what he did. And when I realized all of that, I said, man, this is too important. And the name of the company was Crystal Ice Company. I blew it off of that picture. Paul, oh, could you please tell me about this photograph that you're holding? So, my father was always a horse enthusiast. And he fell in love with what's called a Tennessee walking horse. And he had several Tennessee walking horses. This is one, and this horse's name is Midnight Sun. He bought this horse, I think, for $5,000 around 1959 from a man named Mr. Conruff up in Ethel, Louisiana. Who, who raised a uh, Tennessee walking horse. That's in East Feliciana Parish? And this Ethel? Is, yeah, going up, going up to Ethel, yeah, East Feliciana. And uh, these Tennessee walking horse was shown all over, but ma mainly the Dixie Jubilee in uh, Nashville, Tennessee was where the big boys went. And these horses walk with high steps, and you can see the back of that horse tail how it's cut up, well, they used to cut the tendons in that tail and put it in a rack to make that tail set up like that. They used to put chains on his feet to teach him how to raise his feet up high when he walked. And he was a gated horse. So that's what a Tennessee walking horse is. And then how to hold his head. So I used to exercise this horse in the morning 
And I told you I was riding when I was four years old. And you can see it's got this little bitty saddle on it, which is an uh, 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 English saddle, which is what they rode Tennessee walking horses with. And your dad dressed in his fondest of suit in his hat? Oh, he ain't never rode that horse without a suit and towel. Here come Mr. Davis. Ain't never seen a brother that clean on a black horse with baby oil wiped down. That, that horse was so clean, they, 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 they be waiting. They be waiting to see that horse. And uh, this is at uh, Brian's Furniture in Port Allen, downtown. And he didn't bag this horse up in the corner, and this horse is just stayed. And mm -hmm. then as the parade comes, then he'd get up and get him out and let him walk. You Where'd talking. you find that picture at? Your dad was Yeah, we had this at the house. Mm -hmm. We cherished this picture because we had another horse that he got, and it was a Palomina. And my name is Fox. He named that horse Fox. Cause that horse was the prettiest man looking horse you ever seen. Now, this is a giant, but that Palomino, love how much the tail on that horse, and I don't have no pictures. And that's why I'm saying I got a lot of stuff I miss. But we had several horses, but those were the two key horses that was real, real high end. He had a, a friend of his named Dr. Bertrand Tyson. Dr. Bertrand Tyson was a horse lover too. Mm -hmm. He was the first African-American doctor to work in Speedell uh, Hospital in Plotkin. He uh, came from West Baton Rouge Parish because his mom and them buried over there in Ashland Cemetery. He became the director of a hospital in Pasadena, California. And when he died, I flew out there and buried him. He said, tell Fox, told his wife, tell Fox, Come here on my bed. He was the first doctor? He was the first doctor. Mm -hmm. Did he rode, ride a horse as well to visit his oh, patients? Oh, he, he, he used to ride them horses too. Mm -hmm. he, he had a big Appaloosa's horse, I remember. Uh, that man, that was wild. I mean, Dr. Bertrand kind of. Tell me about mm -hmm. this picture here. You have such rich history. Right. So this picture here, I had a lady and uh, she knew that I was very active in the community. Uh, and her name Perilee Clove, and she called me one day and she said, man, I found your grandfather. I say, you did? I say, I know my grandfather, he buried at Antioch Church down in Brewer. She said, no, your great-grandfather, he used to stay on, on, on Allen Street, across from, from the store. I said, you do? So she had this picture in the church. Can you point him out for me, please? That's him right there in the middle. That's the one that was born in 1876? That's him. And I had, a art, I had an artist to draw this picture from me, off of this. And that's how I got that picture. And this was the only one I had. So he was an officer in the, in the church? Yes. This is uh, St. Mary. The, uh, Reverend Price was a pastor. And they had on there where you could read it, and it, this picture was taken in 1941. Mm -hmm. I don't know where he was buried, though. I, I haven't been able to find that part out. But he was a deacon in the church, and that's when I was introduced to him. Now, he had a daughter or two, and my grandfather and two sons. And I think he was staying with one of his daughters uh, back of town when this picture was taken. Because this church was right down the street from where he was staying. He could walk down there all the time. Now, the reason why I think he was buried at Antioch Baptist Church in Loopville, Louisiana, which is up the highway, is I think that's where his mother was from. Was they enslaved, do you know? I don't know. You don't know? I never researched it. I never knew the, the mechanics of, of doing it or, or really took the time. So, why is all this important to you? Because we lost so much history because uh, in serving that community in West Baton Rouge Parish, uh, most of the people I knew lived on plantations. These plantations were provided by plantation owners, and they built the housing on their plantation for their workers. Like sharecropper homes? Yeah, because these are the people that used to work the land with uh, mules, and they used to cut the cane by hand with cane knives. So every plantation had a certain amount of people lived on it uh, based on the land. 
And I didn't know this because there were no black history written in, in, in West Baton Rouge until 1997. And there was a lady named Judy Boyce who got a grant because they built a new museum in West Baton Rouge Parish and she went to the museum. She said, how? Oh. She's in Rotary Club. So I used to see them at that level. She said, man, you know, they ain't got no black history up there at the museum. I said, yeah, nobody has written it. She said, well, we gonna write it. I said, okay, what you want me to do? First thing I want you to do is take me to all these cemeteries on these plantations. And I took her to them cemeteries and she took pictures and wrote down the names of the people who were buried in the cemetery. Name of the plantation, name of the people in the cemetery. I didn't know that she went to the clerk of court office and every plantation owner had the names of everybody that lived on his plantation. And she put those names to, to, to those names. And that's how she started to write the history. So I started to introduce her to my dad and them, uh, what their legacy was, like we're talking about. And uh, they had a 4-H guy that used to travel all over the parish. The first black farmers that we knew that owned land, Mr. Harlow and them. Um, and the communities that was self-sustaining because believe it or not, even coming through the civil rights before we really hit it, there were really a lot of educated African-Americans back then because that's where most of the African-American teachers that used to teach at the school, in elementary school. And fast forward, I realized how important the retired teachers were so we forgot about the knowledge they had that we could have used. Um, so that's the history part of the plantation life that we kind of lost. Nobody wanted to even talk about it or remember it because some of it was kind of painful, I guess, you know. And we have a lot of plantation cemeteries over there right now that has been abandoned. Uh, and they were abandoned when I took her out there. To, you probably, to, can you access them? They probably, are they accessible? Yeah, you can, they got roads to go to them because the people that own the plantation won't touch them. Mm -hmm. They let them grow up. So they all grown up. They all grown up. You can't even see the the uh, graves. Mm -mm, you had to cut to get in it.